Oh, well, it brought all three of us uh, anyway. So, uh, welcome to the uh, this uh, edition or video of the Comics Multiverse. Uh, I am joined by uh, my co-host Mike. How's it going, Mike? It's going good. How are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing fine. And uh, today we're going to be talking to uh, Peter Rios, uh, who we met. I think it was. I think I met you in 2016 because that's when episode 200 of Comic Geek Speak was. 2016? Um, yeah, 16? Yeah. 16? Did I say 6? No, you said 16. You, you mean 2006? I don't know. I was going to say, oh my God. It's been a Time long, has no meaning anymore. It's been a long four years. 2006. <laughs> um, I just moved up to Albany and somehow I found the Comic Keep Speak podcast and it was like maybe a couple months after I moved up, they were having the 200. Uh, episode recording, so I got up early one morning, drove down, uh, spent the day with the the Comic Geek Speak uh, crew and everybody that was there, and then drove back and got home about four o'clock in the morning. Wow! <laughs> Probably not the smartest thing I have ever done. And then uh, it's it's because of the of Comic Geek Speak that I met Mike. Yeah, I came down for episode three hundred, and your car broke down. <laughs> oh geez that was the, the the second day i had to get like a tire fixed and a bunch of other shit the dumbest thing so there are a lot uh, of people a lot of road stories uh, uh people traveling from all <laughs> over i've heard a couple things uh i thought there was something involving a deer that somebody had but i don't remember <laughs> but uh and then uh, for like the, uh, I think it was super shows. Um, I, uh, Mike and I would, uh, were carpooling from Albany. We'd, uh, drive down, pick up Ian Levenstein and, uh, Raf Suhu and Beacon, New York and drive on over and just have a grand old weekend with uh, you guys. So how, how have you been since then? <laughs> <laughs> since, since 2016 or since 2006, which one? Oh pick, one. pick one, pick one. <laughs> no. Wait, which which one, which year was Super Show then? Well, that would have been... We had a bunch. We had one in 2008. Yeah. That was the first one. Then we had one in 2010, which was the fifth anniversary. Okay. And then one in 2011. Uh, I usually do it by like who is the guest, quote unquote, like the guest of honor, right? Like 2008, uh, or wait, 2010, I think was was Walt Simonson and yeah. Louis Simonson. I think Lee Weeks was there, I think. And then 2000, that was 2010. 2011 was uh, Tony Moore was there. Um, 2008, you know, we had a, I mean, we, we had a whole bunch of people. I can't remember if there was a guest of honor there. And then there was one in 2013 as well. But. All I remember about um, Walter Simonson being there is all of a sudden, you know, people were standing around this table and he just started doing uh, free quick sketches. And it was like, here. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I saw that video of you guys talking about it. Yanni said he was not happy, not happy that. <laughs> I went to, I think I went to like one of the few panels and then came back and everyone had Simon's sketches. You're like, what happened while I was gone? It's so, crazy to think about how much time has, has passed. You know, like, uh, uh, I don't remember the last time, you know, the three of us, two of us, or whatever, have been like in the same room together somewhere, but it's always like, uh, oh, right, you know. I think the weirdest thing about it, I don't know if you've experienced any of this yet, it's sort of like you just sort of pick up where you were, right? Like you just sort of like, because especially if, if back in those days, if people were listening to Comic Geek Speak, they knew more about us than we remembered saying about our, us. And then <laughs> they would say, oh, how was this? And how was that? And there's like, when did I talk about that? Oh, I must have <laughs> talked about that on one of the podcasts, right? So you just sort of pick up wherever you are, wherever they are and they're listening or you are from the last time you saw them in at some convention or whatever. But I mean, uh, yeah, it's so weird to think how much time has passed and, um, you know, I mean, I'm still doing the same stuff. I'm still reading comics. I'm still, <laughs> yeah. podcasting, I'm still absorbing geek culture. I'm just doing it in the, in the quarantine nature of my yeah. life right now. Well, like you were saying, I, uh, 
I, there's a uh, the past two years there's been a um, small uh, Comic Con put on by the one of the libraries up here in the area, and uh, last uh, last year one of the guests was uh, Dave Ryan. <laughs> oh, cool! <laughs> and so uh, I usually try to interview you know all the new people. I was like, you probably don't remember me, but we met at the Comic Geek Speak thing. So he's like, oh yeah! And then he started talking about the time you and him and some other the others were at the diner. Diner till four <laughs> in the morning. Yeah, right. and he's eating the cheese fries. And- yeah. So, so how did you get into comics? I mean, I know that uh, I know from listening to the you know show how you got in, but kind of tell us your history with comics and you know what got you hooked. I think it's probably like everybody of my generation. If you grew up in the seventies, you you watched whatever was on TV at the time, whether it was like Challenge of the Super Friends or 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 one of the Super Friends cartoons. Um, some random following up on some Batman cartoon, Superman cartoon, whatever, um, Wonder Woman TV show. I do remember going to see Superman the movie at a drive-in, um, but I'm fairly certain I fell asleep shortly after he became Superman and flies you know, towards the screen and then veers off. Um, Cause that's like one of the last, I remember that image from the drive-in. So I was around like five or six at the time. Um, my uncle was a was and is still a huge comic book fan. And he was more of a Marvel guy, so he's loving the whole Marvel cinematic universe. Um, he handed me a box of comics in a beer box uh, <laughs> that he was getting rid of. And they had... Um, the comics or the beer box? <laughs> <laughs> the comics. He had already gotten rid of the beer, right? Um <laughs> I remember it was like a Budweiser beer because I I had the box for a long time. I used to keep the comics, you know, in it. So most of the comics had um, the half of the cover chopped off because they were purchased at like farmer's markets and, uh, you know, they were returnable ones, I guess, from newsstands. Um, And at that time, it was it was a lot of like late, late 70s, Bronze Age, tiny bit of early 80s. Uh, I remember. I know there's there was one X Men comic in there where where Dazzler was first introduced, but again the cover was torn off. Um, uh, some Superman stuff, some some uh, Masters of Kung Fu, um, uh, just just a whole bunch of random one or two Legion comics with micro artwork, you know, um, and they're all gone. Like I destroyed them. I read them. I cut them up. I, you know, they're all gone. So I, I don't know exactly which ones were like, you know, my favorites or whatever. But then shortly thereafter, uh, there was a, a local mom and pop store, you know, just one of those that had the ice cream counters in front and uh, you buy your 10 cent candy and get some sandwiches that had a rack of comics. It was two blocks from my house. And I can remember going down and that was like the first place that I bought comics. And I actually pulled them out for this discussion because I wanted you, I thought, you know, might as well have some show and tell we're here on video. <laughs> these are, except for one of them, these are the first four comics that are still, like these are from 1982 that I, you know, I still have. Um, uh, these are the ones that I bought that I still have that were like, okay, nobody handed it to me. Somehow I got the money, whether somebody gave me money or I stole a couple bucks or whatever. Um, so it's for they're all from yeah, they're all like January, February of 1983 cover date. So you're, you're thinking somewhere around like October, November 1982. All right, so we have Captain Carrot and his amazing zoo crew number 11 feature, featuring the Was Wolf. Um, this this I had to replace. This is Justice League of America 210. Uh, cause I destroyed this. It's got some rich, Buck- <laughs> rich Buckler artwork, uh, crazy story. The Phantom Stranger is in it, which is cool. Um, Marvel team up 125, Spider-Man and Tigra, and also Dr. Strange and Scarlet Witch in a backup story. <laughs> and then, um, shortly thereafter, Marvel two and one, the thing, oh, when the yeah. thing is in the hospital, 
And like, I think like other than the Marvel team up, this one, I mean, everybody's in it. Daredevil's in it. Fantastic Four's in it. The X-Men, Captain America, Wolverine. I mean, like this is probably my introduction to the larger Marvel universe yeah. um, outside of the books that my, my uncle gave me. Um, so I was, that was the bug, right? Like that was the bug. But this is the one that really made me a fan. Shocking. I'm sure. Right? What? <laughs> Number twenty-eight. Oh, I never saw it as a Titans guy. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's all battered and bruised. I have a I have another copy of it too. But I mean, look at the cover. I mean, come on. How you not be, How do you not become a comics fan with that cover? Tara and George Perez, and I didn't know who any of who these characters were. And that was it. My love affair began. <laughs> so. Those comics are all older than me. <laughs> thanks thanks a lot yeah yeah thanks mike <laughs> makes me feel just a little bit better <laughs> so um how did uh you get into how did you take your love of comics and you know build it into you know the podcast that you and uh brian you know deemer started yeah that um boy is that a story so uh, the short version is um, we had a group of friends in Reading, right? Like that was that was the, the foundation of CGS was that uh, a group of us in Reading um, congregated around a comic store named Golden Eagle Comics. Um, at some point from 1984 till 2005 when CGS started. I mean, I, I, had, I had been going to Golden Eagle from like around 1984, 1985, one of their earliest places, if not their earliest store. Um, but most of the guys met um, in like the early, uh, in like the mid 1990s. Uh, we used to all gather at the comic store and talk for hours. And then that led to us buying stuff. You know, I remember one guy telling me about this issue of Black Panther. So that, that was like late 90s, right? The Marvel Knights run where he was like, oh, there's this really great issue where you, Marvel put, they put all the kings together. They put Doctor Doom and Magneto and Namor and, all, and someone else, a couple other people and Black Panther. And they're having like this political discussion. I'm like, what is this comic? And that's how I got into Christopher Priest's Black Panther. Um, which is like still one of my favorite Marvel series to date. So we would just share stories and share. And then of course it became about parties and gatherings and pool parties at my <laughs> parents' house and um, uh, crazy um, stuff online, like in the early 2000s, like, hey, we used to do best ofs. We used to do year of best of things, even before like the podcast, like pick your best writer, <laughs> comic, whatever. We were just nerds. We were just geeks. So um, I was living in Philadelphia and then I was living in New York with a with an ex and then uh, her and I broke up in a, in a sort of like tornado whirlwind of crazy breakupness, right? It was just crazy. So I moved back to Reading, which is where the podcast began. And... Um, I was bored, you know, I, I had nothing to do. And Brian got the idea to do this podcast and he came up with the name and, and, and he's like, Hey, let's do this. You're home. Um, it was a great way to kind of like get my mind off things. And so he, he invited me to come do do this. He was the one who really kicked it all off. And then we just sat in a room in his office and recorded two episodes right there sharing like like the mic you have like i was here and he was here like we that we didn't have a, a system right this is 2005 um and we recorded two episodes and i think our synergy worked we already knew each other um um but you know he and i are so different in in the way we look at comics and the way we talk about comics is that's why that's how it worked and i think that sort of I think the best thing, you know, is you two, uh, is you two know when your hosts really know each other, when you really know each other before you ever start a podcast, you, that's a, a connection that you can't fake, right? Like, and you can't, it's hard to build that connection if you don't already have it. And all of the, our guys had it, you know, we, we just knew each other. So we knew how to talk to each other and how to interrupt and how to work off of conversations. So it was Brian and I, 
And then Shane came on the episode and Kevin came on the episode and Jamie D and Matt and Adam and pants. Like it just, it just built from there on and on and on and on. Um, until we were just sitting around a room talking about comics like we had been doing for 10 years prior to that. So, um, that's really how it all happened. And, and, uh, um, 15 years later, they're still recording. Right. And there's a whole community of people that have met because of you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's really kind of, it, it was, it was like the social media before social media, you know, like it was the. It was the new fandom. They used to call it the new fandom. Podcasting began before it ever hit iTunes. Um, uh, you know, it was all blog spots and, and RSS feeds and that's it. And podcatchers. And then all of a sudden iTunes was like, oh, okay, we'll start doing podcasting as well. Um, and that's where it blew up. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, as your, as your show is testament, I mean, the, the relationships still go on. Um, through all the changes of not only the hosts on, on Comic Geek Speak, but the way podcasting is done and also the changes in the comic industry and fandom and, and you know, our life in general. So, Yeah, we've definitely, like, I could definitely see looking at stuff from, like, uh, the way Marvel.com and the way DC handles the stuff. And essentially, they're just trying to capture kind of that, that early podcasting feeling of, Hey, we're yeah. just friends sitting around doing this, except they're all, se you know, semi-famous. <laughs> right. They're all personalities, right. Yeah. Or, they're, or they're trying to become personalities. Like yeah. I, I just tried to watch something on the DC universe app. Uh, it was just a, basically a round table discussion. Um, it was on Batman and teenage uh, mutant Ninja turtles, the crossover. And, um, I mean, eventually they got into it, you know, they got into the conversation and it was like, okay, that sounds like a conversation. But until then it was all like, okay, so we read this and, and, you know, it was just the worlds were, and what did you think about this? And I'm just going, oh, this is, this is why I can't listen to modern podcasting sometimes because they're, they try to make a show out of it Man. when they should really just talk, just have conversations. You know, that one panel, that was great. Yeah. That was a <laughs> <laughs> so uh one of the things that uh may, people you know who may not know about comic geek speak um or you know anything uh you're really into crisis on infinite earths am i <laughs> am i really am i really just happens to have them right next to them <laughs> wait, in case they come uh, up wait uh am i really Ninja crisis, <laughs> double dipping, triple dipping. Uh, again, I love the video format. You can have like a show. <laughs> account, right? So, uh, what, what was your other pop comics do you have sitting <laughs> that's, around? Ready? To that's that's actually it. That's actually. It. <laughs> I only brought one prop. <laughs> uh, but I love your setup back there. I love the infinity. Go. I don't. You know. I have oh. a boring white. You know. But like, oh, there's the thing. Cool. Great. I got That's these awesome. nice uh, blinds. Right. <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, you, I've got my whole line of oh, nice primes <laughs> over there. <laughs> if there's nowhere else for them to go, That's great. So I hear you dabble in Crisis on Infinite Earths. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. What was your uh, first exposure to that? Uh, you know what? What? And what? What is it about that? You know, event that you know makes it stand out for you. Um, so, uh, on, so part of CGS is a spinoff called the crisis tapes that I, that I co-host with Adam Murdo, um, from CGS. And we still do it to this day. There are still some new episodes that we dropped, uh, earlier this year. And we're, we're talking about doing some more. It's, it's definitely, <laughs> you know, a long, uh, form podcast. I mean, we're trying to look at every issue of crisis on infinite earth, but sometimes, like we just did issue five, it took us four episodes, four three hour episodes to do a look at crisis. Um, one of those hours, I mean, one of those episodes was just the cover of issue. So you guys five. were just skimming the surface, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Just quick surface impressions, you know. <laughs> That's it, you know, and then the rest is all just, you know, random talk. Um, but on the show- Isn't Jericho's I'm, hair nice? <laughs> I met a, I met a listener at MOCA one time, the, the convention in New York, the indie convention in New York. Um, 
who listened to the show, listened to the crisis tapes, and he coined the term crisis kid, um, at least from, you know, I'm sure somebody else said it, but he was the one that kind of brought it to us because of the podcast. Um, I believe his name is AJ Campos. I always like to give credit. I think that's his name. I can't remember. Um, and he said, you know, there's this real kind of comic fandom that grew up when the crisis was going on, when it was hitting the stands in 1985, right? And, and you know, every, if, if people don't know, Crisis, huge DC comics, sh earth shattering event that the small CW, event. small event that the CW just did, you know, on their TV show last year. Um, you know, they tell you, they tried their darndest. They, yeah. <laughs> And we're actually going to do an ep a couple episodes about that because, um, of course, of course, we will. There, there's uh, there's some cool stuff in there. I, I, there's some fun, silly stuff in there. You know, in the way this is how I sort of compare. Not to go on a tangent, but so you know how Watchmen is playing around with the comic book form, right? So they're playing around with panels. They're playing around with how you read panels. Um, they play with the comic book form. I I even make the argument that. Uh, um, Snyder's Watchmen plays with filmmaking, obviously, but especially in the way of like the music they choose to layer on top of scenes, which only really hit me after like the second or third viewing of it. There's a like the Hallelujah song while they're while they're having sex up and up is is hysterical, and I think it's oh, meant yeah. to be right, you know. But uh, these things I didn't really catch on to. So I think the CW did the same thing. They took their version of Crisis. They hit a lot of the beats of the original comic series, but they do it in a way that makes sense for a TV show and for their particular TV show. So, um, so this whole idea of a crisis kid, you said, when did I first know about crisis? Maybe an ad, maybe a, the monitor's it's appearance. Funny. Issue one. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> one or all the little buildups, the monitor showing up here and there. And I was, just enough of a DC fan starting in 1982, 83, that I wasn't beholden to these characters. It didn't, you know, people were going to die. I wasn't like somebody who had been reading since 1950 or 1960. Um, so the notion of the crisis kid is being able to sort of not only do, does the, do the characters live through this event, but readers live through this event. And we've had many other crisis crises since then, but there was something about that first one where it's like, if they can do this, nothing else will ever shock me, you know? <laughs> no and internet or Twitter. <laughs> no internet, no yeah. Twitter, you know, just those little DC releases. Um, um, oh, actually, that uh, another person, another listener through through the podcasting just sent me one of the original 1985 DC releases. I don't know if you remember. Uh, they were like these two-color pamphlets. Um, they were only two pages, and it's basically just current events of what DC is, you know, um, putting out. And, and I think that's probably how I also learned about the crisis. So my mind was blown. It, it, it was like, Oh my God, what is happening? Characters that I know are dying. Characters I don't know are dying. People are changing worlds and costumes. And, um, we all came out of it going, what was that? And how cool was that? And, and look what happened to DC after that, you know, I mean, they needed that to survive as a publishing uh, company. I mean, they were in deep, deep trouble, as Marv Wolfman said at the writer of Crisis at some panel that I saw. He was like, DC was going to tank in mid 80s if they didn't do it something. And this is what they decided to do. So as a comics fan and a crisis kid, and a, you know, how did I get into the crisis was just by living it. And, and um, it is, Comic book events are the Super Bowl of comics. You know, you get now, it's like you get to the end of the year or you get to the summer, you have a big event and then you go on. You know, now it's 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 habit. But back then it was just cool and I got to live through it and um, I am forever scarred because of it. And, and <laughs> I now would, I just, I can't stop talking about it. <laughs> I would definitely think coming from like, especially like being that early, like into comics and just seeing that it's like, Oh, anything can happen at any time. Like, I mean, Barry Allen is gone. You know, these this character's gone. Supergirl's gone. Yeah, just like it, I imagine that being like, it, it's it makes it exciting. Like, oh, there are stakes, and they're not afraid to do crazy things. Right. 
Right. I mean, we had, we also had a good event should do. I mean, it's so hard now. (laughs) We had secret wars at Marvel and I, I love secret wars. I think it's on CGS. We did an issue by issue breakdown of that, you know, like it, people said, Oh, it's just a toy grab, blah, 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 blah. Jim shooter really didn't know how to write the characters. I I don't agree with, well, it was a toy grab, but um, (laughs) I think there was stuff in it that, that later writers were able to mine and it was their version because they knew crisis was coming. So they, they had to compete. Um, they already had contest of champions. So they kind of knew how to, they already were familiar with bringing, you know, all their characters together. Um, excuse me. Um, so it, it was, it was, it was interesting because it was different. It just was different. And, um, I think, I think that, you know, you look at it in hindsight and you kind of go, God, they should have done this. They should have done that. But they were, especially with the crisis, they had no idea. They had no idea. And basically the outcome of DC Comics was fascinating at that time. I mean, we got John Byrne on Superman, Mike Grell on the Longbow Hunters, Tim Truman on Hawk World, uh, uh, you know, George Perez on Wonder Woman, um, Eventually, you you would have you know Batman really taking off into whole new new areas with different writers and different concepts, and Wally West was your Flash, and um, DC was the place to be in mid eighties. Uh, unfortunately, it sort of tanked around nineteen eighty eight eighty nine, but you know uh, that was the whole industry though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it, well, I mean, even just sort of artistically, if you read like DC comics in the eight, eight like. That power of the atom series in like 1988 is terrible. Um, <laughs> you know, they did they did some weird things there for a while that that kind of burned off the good energy from from the crisis. So, kind of like uh, I would think like late 90s, early 2000s Marvel was just like they, they were just they just didn't know what to do. And what brought them back? Crisis, yeah. uh, Civil War. So, or I, I I would yeah like I would say like the lead up between like uh, Bendis's uh, relaunched Avengers and right. then up until Civil War and then it's like we're all here right right I mean they 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 really I think you know Marvel Knights you were talking about you in the um, in your your episode about the events right you talked about onslaught right mm-hmm. and I'm actually reading that now <laughs> randomly. Um, <laughs> Because I wanted to read Marvel's development um, post Heroes Return, yeah, leading was, up. I yeah, mean, as, a, as a kid, tough. that was so interesting to me. My mind was just like completely blown. Right, I read those onslaught issues over and over again. Right, and their the dialogue is all over the page, and it's crazy. But like, it leads up to Marvel Knights, which was the first sort of step in, in Marvel's rejuvenation that those, that Marvel Knights brand did oh, wonders yeah, yeah. for them, obviously, yeah. because then Joe Quesada becomes the head of everything. And he still is today, you know? Um, and you're right. Like Bendis taking over the Avengers and suddenly the Avengers overtake the X-Men in popularity and sales. And it's like, what, what we, nobody ever guessed that. And then when civil war hit, that was it. Like Marvel just, just yeah. like the crisis sort of took off and <laughs> became uh, a much more unified publishing company. Um, so it seems like all those big events kind of take that, the good ones really spread um, excitement among the writers yeah. and creators and all that. And and that's what events should do, uh, you hope, you know. I was just having the thought of like, and when an event is finished, you should be like, I can't believe they let them do that. Right. Like you, sh- you should feel like you got away with something. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. And you should feel like you should feel like um, you're going to a door that you have no, where, where you have no idea what's yeah. on the other side. I, I, I'm not a fan of people who are like, well, they didn't answer this and they didn't answer that. And they didn't answer that. It's like, no, no, no. Those are consequences of the yeah. event. Those are, those are aftershocks of the event. That's not the event's job to finish. They got you to that point, And now you hope that they go from there. Um, uh, and all of this is, is just to bring it back to your question. I mean, the whole, just reading the crisis has 
made me look at comics that way. I think I look at every comic. This um, it's the crisis kid in me, you know, that filter of shake it up. Let's see what happens. Well, oh, shake it up and make it make it mean something. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, what uh, what character? Let's say from both from both DC and Marvel. Uh, do you feel is like an underused character that you know you would that you personally would like to see them? You know, it doesn't get like we have like you know five million Batman and Superman stories, but there's you know there's a bunch of other characters in the in the universes. Which you know character would you do you see has the most potential? Wow. Um, five. <laughs> 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 I mean, they they've shown they can do it. They're doing it with uh, like Moon Knight right now in Aaron's Avengers, where it's just like, oh, if you want a character to be a big deal, you just have him come in and be a big deal. Right. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's like it's funny you said vibe because my ex loves vibe on the Flash TV show. Like, you know, it's completely it's, unrecognizable to yeah, you character. know. But still, hey, great. Like, I'll I'll take that. Um. That's hard. You know, for the longest time, I used to say it was the cosmic characters in, in at DC. I feel like they always kind of get there. And then, like in the way that Marvel did with Annihilation years ago, again, to talk about another event, you know, like when they, the whole reason we have Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy in a movie is because of everything that Andy Schmidt and Bill Rosenberg, I think his name is uh, Keith Giffen. Everything that they did with wow. um, Annihilation and and the spinoffs and Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning doing yeah, Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy. You know, like it didn't start when Bendis took over Guardians. It took it really started like in wow. two thousand four, two thousand five. So I want DC. I would love DC to do that, but they only really kind of center it around the Green Lantern universe or spinoffs. And I think there's so much more, you know, Tom King's Omega Man. Oh yeah. Was, it was great. It, 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 um, it, it, I don't think that flavor of it would, would be able to last, you know, but it was cause it was really good. But I think the version I'm talking about it is like space opera, sci-fi, um, get your Omega Man in there, get the other aliens of the DC universe. Um, um, that would be a corner of the DC universe that I would love because I mean, there's like, they're doing it with strange adventures, but again, it's not, it's more a tale about a, it's more of like a character study than, than on the, on the backdrop of like space opera and sci-fi and all that. But I'm talking about like exactly what they did with annihilation. Um, all these characters, uh, uh, coming together and, and building this whole other corner of the universe. Um, I think that could be, I think that's untapped potential, you know? So like you're just saying there should be some sort of legion maybe that dealt with a lot of the other <laughs> planets that might. But that's different because that's like, that's in the future. Like they're, they're, they're sort of shut off, right? Like I think Justice League Odyssey could have been that because they were going out, right? But, yeah. you know. Um, too, like I said, too many times it's with the Green Lanterns, and sometimes you get the Dark Stars. That's a concept I love. Um, but there's all these planets out there. Like, you know, let's 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 not just go to Vega. Let's go to somewhere else. Let's try to develop a hero that could exist out in the cosmic universe. You know, um, I remember in the early 2000s. Uh, I'm I'm not someone who ever wants to write comics, be in comics or anything like that. But in the early, early 2000s, I wrote a pitch for Captain Comet of all characters. Lo used to love that character. And it was this notion that he would bounce around and he would sort of be the, um, the pinpoint guy, the main guy that would take you off into all these, all these other journeys. Because I was looking at the concept of how, how many characters got their powers from a comet or something to do with a comet. And, you know, you're talking like Immortal Man and all the way back, you know, his origin has a comet. Red Star, the Russian superhero, has origins with a comet. Metamorpho has origins with a comet, right? So you, way before- Vandal Savage with that? Vandal Savage, right? Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Um, 
way before Snyder did that Justice League um, mini event where the source world, uh, source wall oh. blew up. Oh, no right? justice. No justice. Yeah. My whole thing was that a controller who I love, I love the controllers, right? The spinoff of the Guardians of the Universe was trying to break off a piece of the source wall. Something goes bad and it just explodes. And all of those little fragments of that bigger fragment go throughout all the DC universe, space, time, whatever, so that it could wind up, a piece would wind up in the Neanderthal age, a piece would wind up, you know, um, uh, wherever the, wherever comic fell. And and that would be, so that was like the basis. Captain Comet was also affected by it. And he was trying to bring these characters together or new characters. And, um, uh, and I still have the pitch. I still have my rejection letter from DC. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I loved it because I love the space opera stuff. So that would be my pick for, for DC. Yeah, Good pick. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, um, Kind of getting back to uh, you know your podcasting. Who, who, uh, what uh, interview was your favorite, uh, and was you know there one that you know you haven't done yet? Was there is there somebody that you haven't got to interview yet that you know you would really like to interview? Um, we never interviewed, and I I wonder if maybe it was because, uh. You know, Brian was the producer for the first year, first year or two, and then I took over, and then eventually I took over. Um, we would all try to get interviews, but then I, I, just because of meeting people at conventions, you know, like that was sort of the thing that I started planning. So I used to always get people that, like when we got Terry Moore for Strangers in Paradise, um, I wanted to do that because Jamie was a big fan. Right. And then we got like, I don't know who else. And I, because I knew this person was a big fan or whatever. Um, but I never went after George Perez for some reason. I don't know. Maybe I thought like I was being selfish, like it's for me. You know? I don't know. But so I never got to talk to Perez, which that was like a downer. Um, uh, I did get to talk to Grant Morrison at one convention. I forget where it was, if it was like San Diego or somewhere where they were giving away, you, you got to meet him um, for like five minutes to talk to him um, just by signing up or, or doing something. It was just, nobody knew about it. it. It was like just a small table. I forget whose booth it was. It wasn't a big publisher. Like and, this sticker. <laughs> and I just, and I'm like, wait a minute. You mean if I just stand here, I can talk to, and I was like the fourth person in line. There was only maybe like eight people in line. Nobody knew this was going on. I was like, this is random. So I got to sit and talk with Morrison for like five minutes about, you know, I brought up stupid stuff. Like we're both Scorpios and, and you know, um, I mentioned Jeff clock because he knew Jeff clock, uh, Jeff clock, a writer, about, a writer mm -hmm. about comics, you know, had been on CGS for a long time and he knew Jeff clock. Um, we talked about invisibles. We talked about, you know, some other stupid stuff like that was it. And that, and it was like, I just had a five minute conversation that I don't even remember exactly all the details with Grant Morrison. And I was kind of like, I'm good. Like, I don't, I don't need to talk to him. Like, that was cool. Like I, I got a random five minutes with one of my favorite writers, you know? So, um, one of my favorite interviews, I don't know if I have, uh, I mean, there's, there's some that I think we did really well. There's a lot that I think we did really well. Um, but there were other ones that you kind of walked away. And I was really impressed by Jim Lee um, because he listened to our conversations, I mean, to our questions, and didn't just always give stock answers. And I remember, I think that's the interview where I was like, Jim, do you like doing comics? I think I said something, do you like? And he kind of was like... <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, he thought about it. I was like, okay, <laughs> that, that's interesting. Uh, so he was real. He was real. Like mm -hmm. those, those interviews that were there just real. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, no, you've been, what, you just got up to nine years for the Daily Rios? Yeah. This is year number nine of, of the Daily Rios, yeah. Nine years with that, and then how many years with, with CGS? Uh, CGS was uh, six, 
six years, I think. Yeah. And then I took, it was 2005 to 2011. Then I took a year off. I was, go, you know, I was, I had uh, uh, gotten new jobs and I was, I was like so incredibly busy. Um, uh, so I took a whole year off and that was when DC was doing their whole new 52 thing. And I kind of like pulled back from even talking about comics because I, I just wanted to see like how the discussion was going to go. And then got into the Daily Reels, uh, my own podcast in 2011. Um, I That first year I did five episodes a week. I wanted to do a true daily, minus the weekends, uh, a true daily year version of the podcast and and boy was that difficult um and then from that i mean i haven't done that since now it's like i you know some years i put out like two podcasts you know i think this year i'm averaging of i think there's like 20 25 30 um because i can't shut up i love you know you guys do your own version of of needing to talk about whatever you know like, yeah so i still do it so what do you, what 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 uh what do you talk about on your on the daily Rios? I mean, what what do you kind of what's 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 a typical show? I guess uh, the first year was just anything and everything. I just I kind of uh, someone called it podcast verite. You know, it's just like whatever I was feeling at that time. <laughs> there was like one time I remember I wanted to talk about something, and I came home, and and some news event happened, and suddenly I had to talk about that. You know, like. Yeah because I just was like, I don't really feel like talking about comics when something serious is going on, you right. know? Um, um, it would focus on theater, it would focus on comics, it would focus on my family life, it would focus on geek, you know, geek stuff like Star Trek and movies and books and, and all that kind of stuff. And now it's sort of the same thing. Now I'm sort of playing catch up because there's a lot of projects, right? Like, I, I don't know if you have a to-do list of stuff you want to talk about. But my to-do list uh, is constantly growing, but never, never, I'm never scratching anything off. So I'm like, I gotta <laughs> scratch stuff off because I can't keep this up. One um, of us is working on an X-Men project, oh, not me. Um, <laughs> it gets to be a lot, right? It it will just I've. It's the thing of I just need to do it, but it's just but there's so many things to do. I know so many other things to get done. I, one of the things I did was I started um, watching Star Trek from from the very beginning because Next Generation is my Star Trek, but I Thanks. and I saw a few episodes of the original series, so I said let me go back and I watched all of the original and all the animated and all the movies and all of Next Gen, and right now I'm into Deep Space Nine. I just finished finished Deep Space Nine season four and Voyager season two. Okay, so Deep Space Nine is starting to get real, real nuts. Right, right. <laughs> and I'm doing podcasts about those, but the problem is, is I'm watching it in broadcast order, so I have to watch an episode of Deep Space Nine and then Voyager and uh, then Deep Space Nine because that's how my brain is. So, like, that's one of the projects. Like, I want to get that done with so that I can be done with it. You know, um, I never finished. I was doing a whole bunch of episodes on Morning Glories from Image Ooh. Comics that I never finished. I, there's another series I think I – did they finish that? It got up to issue 50, and then they stopped. Okay. I think um, I have most of the trades for that one. I always had to reread those from the start every time Yep. between all the characters look too similar. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's time travel and everyone looks like each other. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I do yeah, them in fun. yeah, I do them in episodes that match the trades. So okay. so that you know people if they listen to it, they can just read one trade and then listen to one episode. But that's a project, right? Like because now I have to go back, like you said, because I don't remember what I what the hell I talked about. Um I'm so those are big projects. Another project is um I still haven't finished Heroes in Crisis. I have one one more episode Ooh. to do about issue number nine. That's like two years in the making. Um, th therefore, while I was going through and talking about shows that I have done, theater shows, I was going through sort of like a chronological order of shows that I've done. And because I have people who listen who like musical theater, and you know, everybody's in a musical theater world nowadays with Hamilton and Frozen, and you know all these crazy um thing live <laughs> avengers the musical avengers the musical <laughs> uh, but even like the live musical shows right the live musical productions and there's musical 
episodes of Supergirl and Flash. And um, so I was going through that that I never finished. So it's always me playing catch up, I think. It's just like, what project do I want to attack today? There's too, there's also just too many things. Right. <laughs> it's like way Netflix, too many. There's like 20 shows on Netflix that I probably would enjoy watching, but it's like, who, you know, who can just sit there and do that? Right. Well, I guess now. I lot, can. <laughs> a lot of people have been able to. I went back and started to read Dune, you know, because there's a new, oh. new movie coming uh, out. There's, there's also... Th- new prequel novels coming out um from by by whom by herbert son and uh, kevin anderson uh it's going to be about um duke atreides uh prior to going to dune um and i'm because i read the first volume of dune but i've never finished the other chronicles so i was like i'm gonna do that and it's so weird to read because It, it the first dune book is so hard yeah it's it's, but what's so interesting is, you know, it was written, what, nineteen late 1960s? Um, yeah. And it has a glossary in the back. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the thing that broke me. As soon as I guess, as soon as I gave up on using the glossary, I was like, I, I can't. Yeah. I can't, you can't make up this many words. <laughs> let, let me introduce you to a book called The Cimmerillion. Uh, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I have that. I have that over on my shelf right over there. The, um, but the interesting thing about Dune, and maybe it speaks a lot to we need different voices in sci-fi, but as you're yeah. reading Dune, I'm going, well, this is some of these major beats are no different than what they did in Game of Thrones. Oh, like, yeah. No different. It's you all know? that type of like family yeah. stuff. Yeah. They have and- their magic variation. And I mean, you you had total I mean, the worms and the dragons. I mean, you could right. you can pull all that together. Right. It's so it's so interesting. It's sort of like when I read The Stand, um, Stephen King's Stand. I, I must have tried to read that about, I, I think I started like two, three times. And then one time, this was years ago, I said, I am going to read and finish this book. And I read The Stand and I finally finished it. And all through it, I thought, Robert Kirkman had to have read this for Walking Dead. <laughs> because there's so many beats. In fact, they even say the walk. It says the Walking Dead a lot of times in the book too. But just the whole idea of rebuilding civilization and and certain characters and all that. I was like, there's tiny little bits of this that I feel are in Walking Dead as well. Or maybe it just speaks to the larger dystopian fiction concept. You know. Well, so. I mean, I mean, I know Kirkman is. He's going out of his way. He's like, I, he made sure to stay away. Like, I am not going to ingest any new zombie content because it'll it, it would just be poison. Sure, sure. <laughs> so I, it's got to be like so hard. It's like I I've did this written this for so long, and I can't. You know, you can't go and participate in that discourse. It's like someone's going to accuse me of stealing. Someone's right. going to accuse right. me of all that stuff. Yeah. Now that you mentioned uh, the you know the, the stand in The Walking Dead, I can see how it's a uh, Stu Redman is kind of like a Rick. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I try to think of oh um, um, the Dale character in Walking Dead. There's uh, there is an older gentleman that is is the one that sort of always brings up in the stand about civilization and how to rebuild civili- civilization to the point where he's, he even says something like you know. We have to ask. We have to ask these questions of what civilization is going is even going to be afterwards. And I remember Dale, especially on the TV show, the TV vo- show version of it, brought up a lot of those same concepts and ideas. And 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 it worked backwards for me because I finally got. I had read and watched Walking Dead, and then read um, finally finished the stand after. And I was like, oh, there's Walking Dead. Oh, there's Walking Dead. Oh, there's Walking Dead. So, so maybe it's un- it's probably unfair of me, but I'm not trying to say that you stole it. I just mean, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, there's stuff that goes in your brain. You know? I, and now you're I, living it. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, right. I had that kind of, I saw Apocalypse Now for the first time, like like, oh. a, like a number of years ago. And you said that, and you're just like, oh my God, I've seen this before, but like in all of these different movies, like what they took from it. Right. It's like seeing. It would be like never having seen Star Wars, but you've seen all the movies around Star Wars, and you're like, oh, okay, this is where they learned how to do all that stuff. Right. This is where they stole that idea from. Right. And everything, everything is built on everything else, and I don't, and that's okay. Like that's oh, yeah. 
that's the nature of I all mean, that that's, kind of stuff. That's, that's practically comics. I mean, yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> I think that's probably why I would never write right. comics is because it would be total. I would go back to you know this, and I would just regurgitate that over and over again. Who wants it? They've already done it, you know. So. Well, the other thing, once you start, like, if you're, like, a big writer, it's like, you know what's going to happen in, like, every book. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I, don't tell me. I want to read it when it comes out, but you're already going to, you know. Yeah. Everything gets spoiled for you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, and everyone has to announce all their plans. Right. I would. That's the only thing I would imagine being a creator is like, no, I want to enjoy all this stuff. <laughs> but you have to, like... I mean, like be somewhere being in a room for like listening to Hickman's like X Men plan. Mm. Like, oh my God. I'd <laughs> sit and I'd sit in a room and listen to that. But yeah, but then then you know. Right. Right. Not as much fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, that's kind of how, you know, that's why I really don't listen to a lot of podcasts about comics these days is because I don't want to have anything, you know, influence, you know. If I were to, you know, talk to, you know, the same people, yeah, like, like I know that the eleven o'clock guys, uh, they talked to Zach Krusey, who uh, did a book about Steve Ditko, and when I, I, I talked to him too, so I didn't, I intentionally didn't listen to that episode of Eleven O'clock Comics because I didn't want to be regurgitating everything, you know, that they said. So yeah, it was, it was different, a lot different, you know, in the early days of CGS because not a lot of people were getting the creators. What was interesting is um, if somebody had a new book, you could always tell that they were eager to promote it because they would wind up on, you know, several podcasts at a time. But what I did like was because, because it, they, um, some of the bigger names weren't on a lot of shows, you could listen to, I actually liked listening to the one or two interviews because then I, I knew where else to go with the conversation and maybe not what not to ask this time and um, or riff off like, hey, you once said this. What did you mean by that? And blah, 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 blah. But nowadays, I mean, you know, there's so many podcasts and sometimes creators have their own podcast, you know, right. or, they're, or, they're, or YouTube or they're talking on in, uh, Instagram or whatever. So um, and and a ton of content online as well. Blog posts, written posts. Um, so it's almost it would be too too much of a chore like like you said it would be just too much to listen to too much to read and you just got to try to keep it interesting yeah i'm just i mean heck i'm just happy that comics seem to have we've kind of had our first couple full weeks of uh new stuff right it's just oh i i remember this <laughs> <laughs> just like when the bill's been like five dollars for the last you know five bucks a week for the last couple of months yeah it's <laughs> it's great you think it's crazy i mean it, it's i don't think fandom will will let it disappear totally you know um but i hope that they use that time to or like me personally i used it to kind of go do i really want to keep reading that nah. yeah or do i want to pick this up instead you know like it was actually a nice way to kind of go through the, was, the list. It was just like, man, I have so much money. <laughs> like, that was the thing that surprised me. I'm just like, huh, maybe I do need to rethink some of my spending practices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when like, you know, when five X-Men books aren't coming out a week, it's surprisingly cheap, a lot cheaper. Wow. <laughs> So I, I know you know you mentioned that like you said you, you're kind of not up on you know comics, but how how do you see do you, do you have any ideas about you know how you know with you know the whole diamond fiasco that happened back you know in March and how you know things like DC leaving do you, how do you see or do you have any predictions or thoughts about perhaps the more thoughts about the future of comics? Um, I think what we're going to see, because we're, we're kind of already seeing it is unless, unless we're not at the point yet where they are putting out books that have been created during the, the, the hiatus, right? Like we're probably, we're obviously still seeing a bunch of stuff that was already done. Um, they were just waiting to either ship it or print it, you know? And yeah. I don't, 
I don't think we're quite at the point yet where it's like, oh, this is this is something that has just been done, you know, or done during the hiatus. Um, I feel like it's probably just going to become business as usual. Unfortunately, um, I I kind of wish the publishers were risk felt that they could take the risk and kind of go, all right, let like not to beat on Marvel, but that they are continuing with the empire stuff and, and, and exploded it, made it bigger. And they're going to go right into the, the King is black null stuff. Like that feels like they didn't look at the break and, and, and they didn't go, Hmm, maybe we should kind of rethink how big we want to go. Right. I feel like they looked at the break and looked at DC leaving and go, and they said, great, let's put more stuff on the shelf. And you're like, uh, the, the whole variant cover thing was just the, that was, that was just, ridiculous. This, they were so, ugly. well, I felt bad for the retailers. Cause like they had to buy those variants blind. Right. And then right. they see that that's what they are. And you're just like, Oh, they, people paid money for this where no one would have. Yeah. It's always interesting. I, I think if I look back um, and maybe, you know, it might be my DC bias, but when I look back at when DC takes chances, when they do the risky thing and the initial outcry from fandom and, and social media is always, Oh, DC is doing it wrong. Then when whatever that thing is happens, people start to go, Hmm. Okay. That actually is interesting. Retailers might jump on it. You know, um, readers might jump on it and then what happens is other publishers tend to copy it right um and i'm not even talking about like the whole D the new 52 like there was other things too business wise that dc has done that publishers sometimes are slower to to jump on right like marvel just announced that they're do finally doing young adult novels well dc has been doing that with much success right because duh, that's where the market is. That's where the money is, you know? Um, so I feel like um, DC leaving was not a rash decision. It just wasn't. It, it, they're too, they are more business minded than people realize, you know? That's why they're always slow to put out like, um, even like, uh, you know, uh, letters of whatever like if somebody passes away or if, or if, you know they're always slow because they got to go through all their channels before marvel's just like ah we're here we're marvel <laughs> you know um so so i kind of wish that comics would would take that break and take that little bit of whatever happened and just kind of remember what it's like to have a boom in creativity and, you know, you mentioned about underused characters, like look at their line and kind of go, OK, what comics and what characters work on the weekly, uh, on the monthly system, on the monthly schedule, which characters don't. There's I, you the whole DC giant, the Walmart comics and all that, like yeah. that was I think that was really their first um, test of pulling away from Diamond. Like, I think that was their first test of what it would be like to put comics where nobody expects them to be on their own schedule, on their no own creativity. <laughs> uh, and just just like, you know, clearly there's, they were successful because they, they yeah. stayed around for a while. And, and I mean, now we're cool. getting, yeah, and we're getting more formats. So I feel like, um, I think we need to test those kind of things. And you know what? That probably also means putting comics exclusively on digital more than they already do. Um, they need to ignore retailers. You know, the, everybody says, you know, oh, digital comics are so expensive. That's not the publisher's fault. That's the retailer's fault because they were like, don't you dare make di digital comics cheaper. So that's why publishers were like, all right, I guess we got to make them $3.99 and $2.99 and maybe have some sales every now and then. I mean, that was part of that discussion was because of the backlash from retailers. Um, but imagine if they could put out uh, a book for a dollar, you know, only digital, and then collect it later, which they do with a whole bunch of titles. But I think they want to do more with that. They just don't want to piss off retailers. But I think that change is coming more and more. Um, I think like video games are seeing it now where like 
the digital market is becoming so much bigger. It's like, yeah, what if you didn't, why you leave your house? It's right there. You just hit a button, you pay the same price. Right. And you know what? The movie market's going to go the same way. You know, they're testing that out too. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're not testing nothing right now. Any of the big, big movies, nobody's letting out until. <laughs> but what was, there was one or two. I thought there was like one or two that they were like, yeah, we made a lot of money on that digitally. Well, like Trolls. I think the Trolls, trolls movie. That's what it was. But I mean, yeah. that's a kid's movie. And that's, I feel like, a lot safer. <laughs> I know. I think I think the only reason they're holding back those big movies, you know, sometimes it's either because of the director or whatever. But I have a feeling the one the one that takes the jump on it is they're going to make money. They're going to make money. I mean, how can they not? It's, it's so hard. to. Well, it's just they're charging full theater price. I, I, it's I like I, like I just I just can't justify paying like twenty three dollars to watch it in my home and not own it. Well, it's yeah, crazy. I mean, I can I can see that point, but I think there might be people who. Oh, I mean, there's will. definitely people who would. Yeah, but I, I think it's still like a, ba a barrier. And like, if it was, if it was what movies should cost, like ten dollars or something like that, no problem. Jump and right again, in. Who's wh what yeah, is keeping who's that the price? Be right, that's and the same thing with comics. Who's setting that price? Diamond well, and the retailers are the ones that are setting that price. You know, what is it like? Marvel, the way Marvel does it, you just get the digital code with the comic. Mm -hmm. I wish DC was doing that, or, or I wish Mar or Marvel would stop because then I could just go all digital because right. then those could be separate, they could be cheaper because it's ridiculous to buy a digital Marvel comic when I can pay the same price get the actual comic and the digital comic. Yeah. And again, I think it all comes down to who's setting that price and what, what are the retailers, you know, we have two to 3000 accounts of retailers. Not all of them have, have brick and mortar stores. Some of those accounts, a small yeah. portion of those accounts are just people who have accounts and they sell at conventions or whatever, but that's not doing them any good because there are no conventions anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, I feel like DC took that leap and they said, we got to stop this, this chain. This chain is not working. It doesn't work anymore. It never really was the best chain to begin with. And I think they're going to, I think they're, you know, they're, you're going to see more YA books and you're going to see more direct to digital and you're going to see those little compendiums. And I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those people that says, oh, well, you know, look at manga and look at the, 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 the way they package manga and, Japan is a whole other culture. They they read visually, you know. They they that is part of their culture to read manga. It is not part of our culture to read comic books, you know. It was they, they made sure to try and beat it out of all of us when we were younger. Yeah, right. You know, like that. So it's not cool, nerdy, and right. so we're never uh, gonna like uh, we're not gonna train society to read a thick stack of DC comics in one. It's just not so gonna. Why happen. not? <laughs> well, that's why I think those I've got a stack of Lois and a stack of Jimmy's Olsons I gotta freaking get through, and I can't I, wait. I think that's why uh, messing around with different formats, which DC does well. Look at the whole Black Label. You know they're dealing yeah. with different different sizes and formats, and they're trying to make it appeal to the book market. You know, um, look at this cool coffee table styled book about Wonder Woman called dead earth you know or whatever you know whatever black label thing is happening so the, the uh oh, god dang it the uh one on. of the one of the harley the harley the harleen one mm -hmm. uh, uh steven sedgick i mean yeah put that in as big a format as you want Ste his art is amazing <laughs> right right dc has always been good about taking chances with format you know they were the ones that really made the prestige format popular um back in the 80s you know so what what will the comic industry be i don't know i mean i sort of wish they just would would take uh, take this time and kind of go let's let's be different let's just be different i don't know what that is because i'm losing interest um on, on a lot of comics and Emp empire seems like it's not gonna set anyone's world on fire no they're gonna lose money on that retailers I, are gonna lose money on that I, hey i i I, I love Dan, Dan Slott. I'm a big, big fan. I just, the Cree, Scroll, Kotati stuff does absolutely nothing for me. Yeah. The problem also with Marvel is you, you never know if what they're doing now is because they have plans for whatever they're going to do in the movies later. 
So, so this whole empire thing, if it's any kind of echo to what they want to kind of do in the movies, then they have to do it. They're stuck with it because they got to get it out there. You know, I could see this. It, it seems too dis disconnected to me, but I mean, who the heck knows? Well, who knows? They'll, they'll, they'll take it, one small portion of it and that'll become, they'll, they'll take the name. Just like, right. like uh, with uh, the Ultron or Rise of Ultron, or right, right, right. <laughs> or, Are, aren't they also doing something with swords or something? Yeah, there's the the X Men event. Uh, cro it's Cross of Swords. <laughs> but that's like at least who expected that? That, that that's within, that's within that's at least just within pretty much just the X books. There's mm -hmm. not like a yeah. separate event in in the tradition of X Men events. They're, they just happen in all of the books rather than like having a specific event book. And I, I'm going to read it because I was like, that's that's a ridiculous concept, but okay. I want to see them all fight like with that. swords. Yeah, it's the whole thing about <laughs> swords. Okay, I mean, you got me. Xavier has his sword made out of like the Cerebro yeah. helmet. Is a, <laughs> it's, it's cool as hell. <laughs> I'm for it. See that to me. That to me is like that's interesting. You got me oh, just on the premise alone. Yeah. The the whole. I mean, everyone's gonna everyone's gonna get sick of me talking about it. But yeah, just like House of X and Powers of X, I can't even explain how it, it just like it rebirthed my excitement for comics. I'm like I forgot comics could still do this. Right. <laughs> just knock you on your ass. And that's what I hope they would do. That's what I want them to do. I don't want another Joker war. I don't want, you know, another, I don't need another year of the villain. I don't need, you know, forever evil, forever evil, you know, just <laughs> let's get, let's get some new things. And that almost and, made my list, my event list. I kind of liked forever. Evil. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see. I, 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 you know, I keep myself to fifty dollars a month, which is crazy because I used to spend way more than that, and and it's really just about getting Nightwing and Titans and any kind of handbook or resource book or back issue from Tomorrow's or um, I've been trying to support you know uh, some Latinx creators and um, getting into older things like Spain Rodriguez. You know, like I I don't know that creator and I should, you know, and some Love of Rocket stuff. So my current collection, um, I, I barely get Marvel. I maybe get one or two things from Marvel. That's it. Speaking of Nightwing, uh, what ha have you uh, been reading the Rick stuff? No. <laughs> No. I'm a night I'm a Nightwing collector, not reader, because I know it's garbage. It's probably garbage. I said this on another show. I was like, you know, I'm getting tired of of uh, I th I think I think Marvel was right that when they were saying you know comics should be seasonal, they shouldn't have to be like continuous and continuous. Like it's a let Nightwing go. He'll show up in five other books. You know, let it go. Let end it. Wait until somebody has a really good idea, like like Grayson was a great title, and um, some of that Nightwing rebirth stuff was interesting. But this whole sequence, like, read the room, DC. Like you you <laughs> played this Rick stuff way too long. Everybody's it's a joke. Stop it. You know, like you read it's too much. Um, well, that's uh, kind of what I like. I like how DC has adopted the twelve issue maxi series format for stuff. Right, because you you get a nice chunk of a story without the be, being rushed of a six issue miniseries. Right. You know, like uh, like Dial H, I think did something. Yeah. Where like that that was only going to go so far, but then the they early issues well were issues. so yeah the so early issues were so well received. That Wonder Twins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two two great books that have a voice that are like nothing else like anybody's doing. Right. Again, we Marvel and DC, and I'll, 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 you know, kiss DC's butt on this. Like their, their pop up imprints are great. You know, like, like whether they may not be the comics that you want to read, but somebody's going to read them. Like the Gerard Way pop up imprint with Young Animals, awesome. You know, maybe love, not. All oh yeah, yeah, geez. What? What'd you say? No, I, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, like those were smart and they were curated and they were interesting and you had new voices as creators. The Wonder Comics stuff that Bendis is doing, like I bought every single one of those, you know, because I think that's cool, you know, and I'm a huge Amethyst fan, so we got that one now. Um, I, I wish they would take more chances with that. Like that would be more interesting to me. Imprints, pop-ups, um, uh, you know, to spotlight these characters that don't get a lot of attention. Cause I'm tired of readers going, used to hear it a lot. you like, they're like, Oh, where's, why don't we get a Catwoman book? Why don't we get a Lois Lane book? And then the Lois Lane book comes out and nobody supports it. Right. And then it's like, okay. Cause that Lois Lane book, the first couple of issues is not too bad. It's not too bad. She's never going to sustain a, a lengthy series on her own. So this is the way to do it by mini series, maxi series, um, one shots, you know, so that you build uh, some readership. But then it's also up to the retailers to put it into buyer's hands or to give it shelf space because they don't want to do that. They don't want to. They want their Batman and their Wolverine and their X-Men. And and for my, my job, I traveled around a lot and I'd always like to go to, you know, different comic book stores, especially if I'm there on Wednesday. And I went to one store and I was just like, oh, uh, you don't have a, like, you know, usually sometimes you just ask in case it's not on the shelf or it's like, oh, do you, you don't have Unbeatable Squirrel Girl? He's like, oh, no, I don't buy that book. I'm like, but why? (laughs) That book's great. Oh, that book's so stupid. You can't, it's just like, I'm telling you, I think it is a great book and I would have bought it if you had it. Right. I tell you what, if you go to a market, especially a market that, because this actually happened to me when I was younger. Uh, my mom and I went to a new market in the area and they didn't have any Spanish, uh, a section of any Spanish food. And somebody was taking a survey and they're like, what, what should we, she's like, you know, you really need a whole section of, of ethnic food. You have nothing. A month later we went back, there was a whole section of ethnic food. What store in their right mind would hear a customer say, I would, I'm interested in that. And then go, Oh, well, I'm not going to put it like, that just doesn't make sense. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've said it before, the retailers, the whole retail business of comics needs to burn down to the ground because they are the they are the things that are holding how comics could grow. And I, you know, like I said, it's only two to three thousand accounts that are dictating this whole market. And there's probably somebody at their store that would read Unbeatable Squirrel Girl if they would just see it on the shelf. But no, they want to put another Batman book, and they want to put another. You know, I, I think it was funny. There was even somebody behind Venom me. No, it was uh, Spider Man. He also didn't have any of Spider Man, like that the second Spider Man mm-hmm. series. And I'm like, oh, he's like, oh, well, I would have bought that too. And then there was a guy behind me. He's like, oh yeah, I was gonna get that. He was like, well, there's two sales you just lost. I would have loved to see have seen DC continue like a twelve twelve issue maxi series like the freedom fighters focusing on a story on one of the different earths. Yeah. I think they, I think the, that, you know, it's, it's so funny. Like they, they just hit on that with all the CW programming and the crisis show. It's like you, you, you wish they would echo it a little bit more in their thing. But again, I don't know how far their plans were. And then the Dio left. So it's like, they're probably working on a whole bunch of new plans. And it's like, what are those, where do they go now? Yeah. Um, and yeah. what sells? And what, um, well, clearly, like the death metal stuff sells, you know. It's the only reason why we got death metal too, uh, or, or the, the death metal now. <laughs> um, and it sells and it, and it you know, it, it does have some of that multiverse stuff in it. And, and, but it's like how you got to make sure it's done right. And you got to make sure it's coming out. And you got to make sure that it's not going to overwhelm your reader, you know, but um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the 12 issue stuff, even for a series. Like if you do one through 12 and then you take three months off and then go 13 to 24, like, okay. Like Like the the, saga model or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, like we don't need the weekly warrior thing anymore, you know, like comics, Comics will exist if you if you try new formats and new characters, and that's the only way you're going to get these underused characters in front of people. You know, not to mention if we if we could get away from 
I guess the way the system is now, like we, like, you know, we think back to like, like fifth, like the, the 52 book. We're just yeah. like, I can't believe they're, we're, do they're doing this and doing it successfully. I was like, now imagine if they had like, you know, eight months to just get it all in the can. Right. <laughs> and then, then put it all out week to week to week to week and doing, just do something like that again without murdering like a creative team. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there was a, there's, there's a good example of publishers trying to help retailers get people into a store every week. Yeah. You know, and, and Marvel tried it when they, they put Spider-Man out every week. They were trying to put, um, you know, I think they had a Spider-Man book every, possibly every week or. No, every, yeah. For a while it was, yeah. for a while it was every week. And then there would, they, then I think on like an off week, like a fifth week, they would be like, Oh, it's Spider-Man extra. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, it's not like the publishers don't try to help the retailers. I, I think Wednesday Comics was... Oh, yes. I was just going to mention that. That was great fun. God, that was so good. And, and it the didn't have to... The hardest cover to deal with. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it didn't have anything to do with continuity. It didn't have anything to do... It was all about format and the creators. And it worked. And <laughs> Mark Chiarello was a brilliant editor and a brilliant designer for all of the projects that he did and, and ones that we're still looking at to this day that were his brainchild, you know? Um, and I think, I think they need to, they need to do more of that stuff. They need to, I mean, X-Men is basically a weekly comic right now, right? Like, oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Plus stuff, we, you know, at, at least, at least, yeah. <laughs> there was, there was, there's seriously like within, the first two months of like the dawn of X stuff, there was a, a day when Excalibur, X Force, uh, New Mutants, and I think one other. It's just like, and Marauders came out. You're just like, whoa! Yeah. If you could just limit this to two a week, will ne you'll net every book will always be on time. <laughs> like if you can clearly, you're making them this fast. Dear God. Or I think what could have been interesting too is so I mean you did House of X and you did Powers of Ten, right? Like you have those are concept books, right? Like they're not. That's not an. It doesn't say X Men. It doesn't say X Factor. It says House of X. So why not make a monthly book called Keep It Going House of X, and you would have instead of twenty four pages, forty eight pages or something like that. You know, like a, a an extra book. Well, but it they were doing that with the trades. That like yeah. they would put out special editions of the trades. It was like here's Dawn of X Volume One. Here's all the issue ones. Here's Dawn of X Two. All the issue twos. But then they're also trading the individual books right. as themselves right it, but it's think a crazy idea you could train readers i mean it, it's really just about the publishers willing to take the risk and marvel yeah. doesn't marvel's not great at that train your readers to buy compendiums train your readers to stop looking at compendiums as being trash because what happens especially with marvel like with their anniversary issues they'll have like one story that's new but then 50 pages of reprints you got to stop that. Like you got to train your re your readers and retailers that here's a compendium. All of our X books are going to be split within like, let's say five titles, house of X powers of 10 X, you know, alleyways. And you know, I don't know, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, and here's, here's X alleyways is my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> you know, here's where Marauders, Hellions and X factor is going to be. Here's X. Yeah. You know what I mean? Train your retailers, train your readers take the chance on a title like X-Men, you know, it's too late now, but, um, and I bet you people It'll would never be like, on. Oh, I think it would. But again, you have to train readers. You have to train readers and you have to make sure the price point is good, which yeah. means you can't, you can't listen to retailers. You got to try to make that price point worth it. I could see them doing that with like a digital format, especially like, Oh, just like, here is this bundle of these issues. Like there's no production. You're just like here, oh, here. Here's the digital version. Right. Here's this is the first month of X Men. Here's the first month. You know, here's the second month. Here's and it's all of the books kind of in order. Yeah, but fifty two worked. Yeah, you know, and and it must have worked uh, enough because they kept on doing it all the way through the new fifty two. They, they built the they built the machine to put out a book every week, yep. and they they knew what they needed to do to keep that going. And they were never late on any of those 52 series, oh, at least yeah, from what I remember. Count, Countdown and Trinity were 
and Brightest Day, and then yeah. they did oh, it. With yeah, the, geez, I forgot about Brightest Day. Batman Eternal and Batman and Robin Eternal and Futures End. Like they they kept on doing it, and <laughs> to, you know, to, to various, to various we levels forget of success. About that countdown. <laughs> That's one of the only books where I had like where, where I had that many. I'm like, I don't, I don't. These can go. It's one of the, <laughs> just you figure like you have that many. You're like, yeah, you know, hey, I've got a solid run, and that's the only book where I'm like, I, I could, I can get rid of these. <laughs> it's, it's another one where like the the again the Game of Thrones thing of like the ending just made me hate the rest of the book. <laughs> Like the journey wasn't worth. Like, imagine if like Fifty Two's ending was terrible. Right. How 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 gut wrenching that would be. Like, but it's been so good. And then <laughs> I have a thing about endings. That's actually probably why I've waited to do uh, Heroes in Crisis number nine because I have a I have a whole I'm writing up a whole thing about um, fan expectation about endings and and also um, writers. Um, uh, approaches to endings in comics. I think there's um, room for growth everywhere. <laughs> oh yeah. So eventually, I'll get that. I I still feel like the the meanest thing was uh, the end of Jeff John's run, where they just broke the end. It's like that's not very nice to the writer who's doing <laughs> who's who walks in after this. <laughs> This guy just wrote the end of Hal Jordan's life, and now this. But then the next issue has still has to come right. out. <laughs> well, we've uh, officially solved the uh, comic book uh, industry problem. Mm. So. <laughs> but, uh, Check off the list. Yes. <laughs> What's next? So, um, tell us um, where can people find your uh, your podcast? They can go to the dailyrios dot com. Um, I I put. Um, all of my episodes on there. Uh, it also has a link to my Twitter if anybody wants to follow that. Um, and you'll get the pod, the, the Daily Reels podcast, which, like I said, is just you never know what you're going to get episode to episode. I never know what I'm going to do episode to episode. Um, you also get, uh, if I make appearances on other shows, like I'll drop a, uh, a link to this, you know, when it goes up. Um I do, I guest host on the DC All-Stars podcast where we get to really, I guess, the main focus for me when I'm on there, we're talking about Bendis' Superman books, mm -hmm. um, which has been a lot of fun. Yeah. And then um, Eric and I, uh, Eric from the Longbox Review, we're doing uh, a look at the Baxter run of Legion of Superheroes, issue by issue. Then we're up to issue number 25. And then... Um, I also do the Tower podcast, which is a podcast about the new Teen Titans. So, oh, that all group, of, that group, <laughs> right? My long form deep dive. Who knows when I'll get back to it? You know, uh, podcast, but they're all on the dailyrios.com. Okay, and I, I know uh, you can. They, people can find your uh, shows with Comic Geek Speak uh, on their on their feed. Probably, I know there's the one where you. Uh, do the cover of uh, JLA Avengers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are some of the great, I love it. You can, you can go to the CGS and then look for the footnotes um, mm -hmm. subdivision. I loved doing the footnotes. Uh, deep dives every episode of one issue of a comic, sometimes a cover. That's, <laughs> I'm there. I'm there for it. I'm there for it. It's madness. Yeah. yeah. What, what would you say to someone who wanted to start doing an issue by issue? <laughs> Uh, breakdown in in a podcast format is is it a good idea or a terrible? Idea? I think it's a, well, it's it's it depends on um, it depends on the how deep you want to go. Like, look at all the movie by minute podcasts that are now yeah. all over the place, right? Like, yeah. that's a brilliant thing that uh, you know the Star Wars, uh, the Alex Robinson. I forget who the other one, the guy is that started that whole concept. Like, I love that idea because it's it's everything about like an issue by issue comic thing too. Right. Like, I think me and Chad both did the Watchmen. Uh, minute uh, by yeah, minute. We, and I also, so I did Eric, uh, Eric invited me on for almost famous. Oh, cool. I did the watch one, someone too. It's, it was fascinating because there were things that I never would have talked about if I was just talking about like the first 30 minutes, you know, but to go one minute, like, <laughs> whoa. Um, 
I would say if you're gonna, you know, the issue to issue thing, the, the trouble with the issue to issue thing is you gotta you gotta make sure that um, you can't go too light on your discussion because if it's only like 10, 15 minutes, and especially if it's a long, he's writing, if it's a long form thing, we want to hear more about it, right? But we also, I think what they, what you want to try to do is make connections, make connections to the larger, like when I do it for Crisis yeah. or or Titans, I make connections to the larger DC universe, or I make connections to other Titans titles or whatever. Um, try to give some backstory, you know, read some in interviews and read some resources. I love to read interviews about Crisis, and I'm I collect old Amazing Heroes magazines about Crisis, and you know, I just absorb everything. Um, um, and and. I also, when I write all my notes for something, I'll read a couple of reviews, especially like I'm watching the Titans TV show. I'll read other reviews just to see if, is there anything that I'm way too far off left field that, I, that I'm like, oop, I'm wrong about that. Or, oh, okay, good, yeah. These thoughts are kind of out there, but I'm saying them differently. I'm, I'm coming at it from a different angle. Um, um, and try to make sure you're having fun doing it. Like they want to hear the excitement in yeah. your voice. Um, I remember when I did uh, a look at Donna Troy, I did a whole uh, episode just on Donna Troy. And it was based on a three covers that Phil Jimenez did that connected. And I used the cover and I, I went through the history of Donna Troy. And I got to who is Donna Troy, the classic New Teen Titan story. And I actually started talking and started like getting choked up about it. And I'm like, but then someone emailed me and they're like, oh my God, like, you know, we heard your passion and you know, you, you, I love that story. And it made me cry when I was a kid, you know, all of a sudden, like that's, you know, you talk about, we talked to go back to the beginning of this conversation about the connection that hosts have. There's also connections that a host and listeners should have too. And, and part of that is through your passion, right? Like you can be negative about a comic, but because you're so passionate about it, we, it's so interesting to listen to, or you can be so positive and your passion is there and you're like, you know, this is why this comic is blowing my mind and why I have to talk about it issue to issue to issue. So um, yeah, that's that would be sort of my advice, I guess. Okay. Again, I w uh, want to thank you for taking the time, and I definitely can't. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on uh, Heroes in Crisis. <laughs> Good. Thank you for letting me play in your sandbox. This has been fun, long time coming, and yeah, uh, <laughs> glad, it, glad it happened. No, it's and you know, anytime you uh, you know want to come back, then you know. If, if, you, if you enjoy the torture, then, you know, you're more than welcome back. <laughs> oh, no. You know yeah, me, so I love, love talking about comics, love talking about podcasting, and, and you know, we uh, love talking to people that, that, like you said, way back since way those, those long days ago, <laughs> 2016, right? <laughs> Plus, we can, we can trick him into giving us a master class on comics podcasting. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, you know, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Yep. St yeah, stay healthy, stay here. safe, and uh, you know, stay if you ever have anything, that, uh, stay quarantined. Yeah. <laughs> Read those comic books. That's right. <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, again, uh, thanks for coming on, and uh, have a good evening. You too. Okay. Right. Later. Bye. Bye.